Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Coffee Microcaps uh, morning meeting, the 11th in our series. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anyone who hasn't been here before. I'm just going to quickly run through some uh, housekeeping slides, and then we're going to get uh, straight into it with our first presenter. Uh, compliance and disclaimer. As I said, yeah, that my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps, and this is uh, episode number eleven in the morning meeting series. Uh, for anyone who hasn't been on a webinar with us before, the structure is we generally do these every fortnight. We get two companies in over the hour with, with a kind of rough twenty minute prezzo and then kind of ten minutes for Q and A at the end. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q and A box, not in the in the chat function. Just makes it much easier for me to um, moderate the questions at the end. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded and to be posted on the Micro Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel, probably on Saturday, uh, so you can watch it back if you need to, and you'll be able to find the recordings of the previous ten meetings on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, if you don't already follow us on our various uh, social media platforms, uh, you can find us on Twitter at CMicrocaps, as I said, YouTube for this recording and all previous recordings, LinkedIn, uh, where I do some additional long form content, I actually published a piece yesterday on ASX uh, multibagger stocks. Uh, and I also run a subscription newsletter via the, the Substack platform. So up first today, we've got Mr. Gary Kroll from Sequoia Financial Group. And after Gary, then we're gonna have uh, Mr. Rod Bristow from Climb Investment Management, so a financial services double header today. Um, and with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna hand over to Gary, our first presenter. Uh, Gary, if you want to start sharing your screen, I'll let you know when I can see uh, your cover slide. Yeah, thank you. I'll just um, pull, pull that up. So thank you, Mark, for, for the opportunity of presenting today. Um, what I would like to do uh, is, is hopefully at the end of the session today is basically achieve one thing, and that is um, provide the, the listeners an understanding of what Sequoia is and what we do, along with the Buffett theory that if you don't know what the company that you're investing is does, that you don't invest in it. So my, my major goal today is to at least let you know what we do, um, why we do it, how we do it, what the opportunity is, and when we think we're going to be able to maximise that opportunity. Um, Sequoia's been around for quite some time, but we had a rebirth in late 2018 and the Royal Commission was the was the catalyst for, for the, the rebirth in thinking and we believe Sequoia will be a beneficiary of the structural industry change that, that commenced before the Royal Commission but has, has really accelerated post Royal Commission. And what I, what I would like to do today at the start is just to give you some history about why uh, the industry is looking to, to need to undertake an industry structural change and where it's come from and where I believe it's going to and how that will impact on um, companies like Sequoia Financial Group and, and in some ways the second speaker as well. Um, in, in the 1980s um, and before, you know, when I was first entering this particular industry, the life insurance companies um, and the banks employed agents and you know 95% of the advisors, if not more, were um, agents or employees of the insured and their, um, their position in the marketplace was that they were responsible to the provider, they were not responsible to the client. And um, whilst you know, the majority of those advisors look to provide the client you know, a good service, the, the reality was that they were agents of the insured and selling product of that party. And clearly that was, um, you know, in, in today's times, if we look back, that was a flawed model because, you know, there was no impartiality. If, if you worked with AMP, you sold 
a hundred percent A and P product, and you, know, you didn't even really know what National Mutual, Colonial Mutual, MLC, and all of the other providers provided to the market. You just marketed A and P everything. In, in two thousand, um, a shift in the advice industry occurred. So, what what took place then was the the regulator was looking to move um, the responsibility back to the client so that the advice provider was moved from being an agent or a employee of the product provider to being responsible to the client and become their servant um, and licensing of financial planners commenced so the australian financial services life um, license was born and you know there was a real scurry at that time and banks and product providers um, set up distribution arms um, with an AFSL and were aggressively buying the market. So you saw basically every single bank, every single insurer, um, and almost every major product line owning distribution. And they set up models where they subsidised the, the cost of providing distribution to the advisor in some ways. And the aim was whilst they did allow advisors to recommend third-party product, there was always some perceived bias um, to house product. And some of that is why the Royal Commission um, inquiry into the banking, supernatural and financial services industry took place. It wasn't a complete reason, but it was certainly one of the reasons. And the findings of that Royal Commission really has is what's created the tailwind opportunity for the Sequoia Financial Group. So, so what... What that meant in essence, um, and, and this is still evolving, um, and there's still a number of providers um, that, are, that are looking to have vertical integrated models, but really that the advisor themselves is looking to separate themselves from product. Um, advisors rep represent the client's interests and they don't want to be, um, have any bias whatsoever to a licensee's product range. They want to recommend strategies and solutions that are not vertically aligned to product. And the licensees who have no alignment, like Sequoia, we, we believe um, are the future. There, there are some vertical integrated models. So AMP still has um, advisors. Um, IOOF have just acquired the MLC group. Uh, and they're still having vertical integrated advisors, but most of the banks are moving out of the sector um, and sticking to being product providers and groups like Sequoia um, and a few other groups in the market are emerging. And there's 12 million working Australians at present and there's 25,000 ageing advisors. The, you know, the average age of an advisor at the moment is around 57 years old. Um, there's hot, you know, new educational requirements in addition to what an advisor who's been working in the industry for 30 years needs to, to have. Um, and we, we expect that number to reduce as some of the educational requirements for someone who's 60 plus needing to go back and get an additional degree um, will, will exit the industry because they're, they're not prepared to do that at this stage in their life. And we, we expect the numbers to reduce from 25,000 to 20,000 by 2024 before they start to recover again. Um, one, one of the issues with that is there's simply not enough advisors to service the needs of the market. Um, and and that, that's a problem the industry has. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for us because if we have you know, a large number of advisors servicing um, the client bases of, of the Australian community, Will be in a strong position, but but you know, looking at it more broadly, the industry does have a problem here where we won't have enough advisors to service the needs of Australians. And you know, at, at present, there's um, there's a little bit of a lack of trust because of the history um, of of the industry, but it's certainly beginning to change where more Australians are beginning to to seek out an advisor. There was a survey done recently. Um, where people were asked, do you expect to, um, to see an advisor in the next 12 months? And the numbers are far higher than they have ever been. Um, but in the next three to five years, um, the number was sort of moving towards 50%, whereas the traditional number has been close to 20%. So 
clearly the opportunity for, for the market to, um, you know, just to try and service that is going to be a challenge. Um, what we see those advisors are the gatekeepers. And, and if you look at the mining industry, they're, they're really the explorers and the, and the producers of the financial service industry. And what we are at Sequoia is we're the mining services company. So we provide the services to these gatekeepers. We're not specifically um, advisors ourselves giving the advice out to the market. We're, we're the service provider to those gatekeepers, but not in product. We're, we're in the, um, the area of providing the type of services that they need to operate their business far more effectively as um, self-employed single operators. Might just touch on, on what these gatekeepers are, because I refer to it in my management meetings with my, my team all the time, but it's, it's a terminology you don't hear too much. But, but, but simply put, the gatekeepers are the 25 advisors seeking a license or an oversell. So that, that's the core um, gatekeeper that I'm talking about. And if we can look to interact with more of those and have those 25,000 advisors a higher percentage of those under our licence and using our services, um, that, that's what success looks like for us. Secondly, um, there's, a, there's a, a major opportunity for um, a group like Sequoia with such a wide offering, um, wide service offering, to provide our services to other AFSL holders and their advisors. Um, and, and thirdly, the, you know, the other gatekeeper that's, that's of significance is the accountancy practice and tax agent. Um, some of those become the license um, holder themselves. Some of those like to refer it to another advisor. And some of those just purely like to um, provide information and general advice to their, um, their client base who seeks some form of advice. So we are looking to provide service to those main three gatekeepers. There's a few others that we look to provide to, being lawyers, self-directed investors, um, superannuation funds and fund managers, but primarily... Um, our focus is on those three things. Our success will be, you know, as I said before, what percentage of the 25,000 advisors do we provide a licence to? Secondly is the number of service offerings each of those advisors selects to engage with. And, and, I, and I write select is because it's not compulsory. We arrange services to self-employed advisors who use our licence and elect to either use our services or other party services in respect to service offerings. Um, obviously, under the license, they can only recommend product that we allow them to um, and provide strategies that we allow them to um, give advice on. But with, with service offerings, um, they certainly can provide third party providers or in a lot of cases, um, such as an accountant or tax agent, they, they do it themselves. Um, but we, we just look to offer you know, some additional services that, so they can do that. What, what, what are the services that we provide? We, we basically have four divisions. In 2021, we're expecting revenue of $100 million. Um, so we have a wealth division, equity markets, direct and professional services. The wealth and the equity markets are our prime revenue base. So we expect 40 million in each of those top two. So 80 million of our 100 million is coming from our wealth and equity markets and our professional services and direct arms, it it's, it's makes up about 15 million, so seven and a half each. What, what we do there, so clearly in the wealth arm is the licensing of the gatekeeper um, is our prime function. We currently have 405 advisors that we provide the licensee to, um, you know, very much like a, a McDonald's franchise. So we're the licensee the independently, um, the independent business owner owns the franchise of kind and operates as us and provides advice and pays us a fee for, for um, us providing services to them. And we have 405 of those. That number increased 73% in the last 12 months. So, and that is our key driver. We, we want to own 10% of the available advise up market that we consider of a standard that um, that meets our criteria. We, we would like to be what we call the premium provider of financial advice in the marketplace. Um, we don't think there is such a thing at the moment. So, you know, if you look at 
fast food, you know, you know the first thing that you, know, you, you do think of brands immediately. You think of maybe Red Rooster in Kentucky and McDonald's and Hungry Jacks and so on. In, in the financial advice space, there is no um, name that automatically comes to most Australians' um, head. And over time, we were hoping, we're hoping that our licensees, because of the services we provide and the quality of advice we provide, we can move to that position. So when an Australian ha has an event that requires financial advice, they automatically think of a brand and then our authorised representatives become a beneficiary of that. Um, so that, that clearly is our core business. Our, our second um, arm in wealth is um, a corporate function. So we have we do IPOs, capital raises, mergers and acquisitions, um, all, all things like a corporate arm of a, of a, of a broker may do. Um, it extends a little bit outside of equity markets that may also um, look to um, service you know, debt and buying and selling of businesses um, that are not aligned to the ASX. Um, and we have a, a team of six in that area. As an example of that, we have a, um, a company that we were the lead advisor to that's listing on the ASX today at 11.30. Um, we raised $20 million um, on a $60 million IPO for a company called North Store Resources. The code is NSM. And the, the majority of the money raised in that um, IPO went to our distribution networks. It, it didn't, um, the public, whilst they got access to the IPO, did not um, get much of the, of the IPO um, uptake. Um, you know, what we're trying to do with our corporate team is provide ideas and opportunities for our advisors that um, gives them a point of difference um, ahead of other parties um, in the marketplace. It, we, we provide research um, to our advisor base. Um, we do that in a number of forms. We do it both internal and external providers. And, and, the, and the purpose for that is to give, again, it's all about improving the advisor's business. So we, we provide our advisors with Morningstar research, Lonsec research, SQM research, um, a website called theyieldreport.com.au that we own, as well as internal um, research providers. They're salaried providers, salaried in, um, parties, so looking to be very independent. So when they write a research report for our advisors, whether it be on the ASX 200 or a specific company, um, it's as impartial as we possibly can and it's, and it's a tool. So when the advisor's out in the market talking to their client base, they've got tools um, to be able to deliver their advice. That's the core area of our business. The second area, second, third and fourth area are, are services to, um, to these licensees and independent businesses in their own right. I might speed through those for the benefit of time. We have Morrison Securities, which is a direct equity and clearing service. So many people who work in equity markets would probably know of Pershing and all stockbrokers in the market um, need to clear with the ASX. So we are a provider of equity clearing and services to the marketplace. We have more than 50 AFSLs, um, including our own, that, uh, that use our Morrison Securities clearing business. And that's a business that we spent a lot of money on a couple of years ago to create scale capability. And in the last 12 months, we began to see that um, move from being an investment to actually being a, um, a business that generates some profit and cash for us and introduces us to more gatekeepers, which is, which is part of the equation. Um, it, it does appear to be a little bit diverse to the core offering, but really what it does is, is allows us to, to meet more and more advisors in the marketplace that are offering a service to the public, whether they be an AFSL or an advisor looking for a home. We, we also, in that particular area, provide specialist investments. We, we don't um, have any of our own product. Um, the specialist investment area that we do is we work, um, someone may come up with an idea and say, look, I'm looking for yield or I'm looking for growth. Um, I'm looking for asset protection. Um, and we go directly to the international banks and create a product of theirs for our distribution. And we, we do have a PDS that we, we, pr we put it out under our name, but it's always a third party um, tier one international bank. Um, we, we, don't, we don't do a lot of that. We, we might do um, 
six or seven ideas per annum um, for either the distribution network or sophisticated investors looking to, to make an investment in particular thematics um, that's not available in the retail space. On, on the professional services side, um, we provide general insurance, particularly for accountants. So we specialise in PI insurance, directors and office insurance for accountancy practices. We do legal documents. So that is the, the establishment of companies, trusts and super funds for the accounting industry. And they then um, provide that document to their client base. So we're a, um, a legal firm um, and we service around 2000 accountancy practices through that business that again can be either licensed through us or use other services. And we provide a self-managed super fan administration business to accountants, um, financial planners. We don't do real, we do not deal um, business to consumer. We're pure B2B services. So we're not looking to compete with the accountancy practice or the advisor. Um, we're looking to provide services to that accountancy practice or advisor and our self-managed super fan administration business, engine.com.au, is 100% um, Australian run. So we don't outsource offshore at all, which is quite unusual. Um, we have all of our administration done in-house and use a variety of softwares, but predominantly um, the class um, super, and we provide audit, administration, actuarial certificates, and charge the accountant or the advisor who then charges their client what they, they choose to charge. Um, and we're very competitive to them so that they can generate um, more return on, on their time. Um, media, we own a, a business called Financial News Network. That, that, that does two purposes. It provides information to our advisors in that we interview almost all um, financial services companies, whether it be MLC or um, AMP or um, client asset management um, about what their process is and, and the advisors can then go onto that website and see what the investment manager is thinking at any time um, to get a good understanding of, um, of what they're looking to offer. Um, we provide a general advice facility for sophisticated investors. So a lot of 708 investors and so on don't want to go to um, a financial planner and go through the process because they know what they want. They just um, want some general advice. So we do have a robo general advice team that can help with that. And we also provide trading technology. For Starter is a business that we've owned for a long time, um, but we predominantly provide Iris um, and we're an Iris on seller so that if people are looking to do equity trading through Morrison's, they can use Iris or, or our own Bore Starter. Benefit time, I'll, I'll move to our, our results and then, then, then sum up. Um, 2020, we, we had $84.5 million of revenue and generated $4.8 million of operating profit um, and $1.9 million of net profit after tax. So a reasonable result, but not, not the sort of result we're hoping to, to generate long-term. Um, that was 2.2% net profit over revenue. Um, but we've, we've come from a long way back and we're, we're building out something that's um, long-term. I, I see us as the tortoise, not the hare. Um, and the result of 4.8 million operating profit in 2020 um, was up 300 plus percent from 1.1 million in 19. It, it gave the board a confidence level to pay a dividend. Um, we, we see ourselves as a growth company, so we're not looking to have a high dividend payout ratio at this stage, so it's 25%. Um, but we'll grow that towards 65, 70% over the next five years. Um, really, we're looking to reinvest the cash that we generate to grow um, rather than pay dividends at this stage, but we're going to give um, an increasing dividend over time. Um, our equity is 33.2 million. That increased as a result of, the, of um, reinvesting the 75% of our profit. Our cash is very strong. We have you know, zero debt. And we have $16 million of cash. If you look at our balance sheet, it shows $22 million of cash. Um, the reason that's um, not quite um, all our cash is because we hold some bonds and some cash on behalf of clients that trade with us. But, but $16 million is our cash. Um, we need around $10 million of that for um, regulatory capital. Um, so we, in essence, we have around $6 million spare cash. There's a pool of money. Um, for future acquisitions. And 
you know, the other thing is that the board and the management team are highly invested. So, you know, uh, uh, we have five um, substantial shareholders on our register and 30% of the board and management, more than 30% um, is, is taken up by the management team. Our key missions um, from here is to, is to continue to increase revenue by you know, well over 20%, um, increase the, the cross divisional opportunities, continue to generate more than 15% operational profit on every one of those businesses. Um, we made a decision 12 months ago, which we told the market, if each business unit can't generate at least 15% operational profit as a standalone entity, we will close that business. Um, and that's what we've done. So we've now got 11 spokes, all of them generating more than 15% operation profit and all of them with you know, significant opportunity to improve. Um, we will look to um, deploy $6 million of our current cash um, to grow. Um, you can probably hear my grandson in the background um, calling out. So that's, that's the noise. Um, being locked down in Melbourne is a challenge. Um, and the long-term the long mission is to um, as I mentioned before, increase the dividend ratio from 25% to 65% over the next four or five years, interact with 30% of the accountancy market practice uh, market. So there's 10,000 accountancy firms in Australia. We are um, currently touching about 20% of those. We would like to increase that to 30. We would like to provide licensing services for 10% of the market. Um, you know, we think there'll be 20,000 advisors um, in the marketplace of that number, we think around 12,000 to 13,000 suit us. Um, so we would like to have 1,200 advisors um, by 2025 as our goal. And, and we wanna build a brand to be the premier brand. Um, just just finalizing the win, um, success for us is to be the, you know, when the market says, um, I want some financial advice. Um, you know, the person's you know, talking at the barbecue says, oh, why, why don't you talk to someone at Sequoia? That, that's, the, that's the goal. 2018-19, um, we had 250 advisors, 50 million revenue and less than 3% operating profit. So just surviving. Um, at present, um, as a result of a number of acquisitions and, and the growth that we've experienced over the last 12 months, and, and more so being, you know, very focused on, on what it is that we want to become. We've been able to grow that, that number to 400 advisors. We expect $100 million revenue this year, and we expect to return at least 5% operating profit, so more than 5 million operating profit currently. 2021-22 um, target is to grow that by another 50%. And then 23, 24, up towards that 10% target. Our current market cap is $38 million at 31 cents per share. Our cash is the 16 million. So our enterprise value um, is 22 million. And we're currently trading at around 4.5 times enterprise value in operating profit. Um, you know, the opportunity and success is significant. Um, you know, if we were to achieve that 1,200 advisors goal that we've set, we expect that would be $400 million of revenue. We would expect to generate at least 8% operating profit, um, which is a $32 million um, operating profit number. So when you look at the current enterprise value of $22 million, you can see if we do achieve what we what we um, have set as, a, a, you know, as an ambitious goal, um, Sequoia is really an opportunity for the long term. Um, but you know we're not a, a mining company that's going to drill a hole and, and find gold. It's the tortoise, um, and I, I think if what I've achieved today is to give you an understanding of what we're looking to achieve, and as we do achieve those targets, you, you have us on your watch list, and you can see that you know is this a company that um, you know does what it says um, and slowly, slowly um, begins to achieve the thing. I think there's a great opportunity um, for, for the investment in Sequoia. And, you know, finalising with Warren Buffett's other statement, the best time to, you know, the, the, how long do you hold an investment? We're hoping our shareholders look, you know, consider holding us forever. Um, and we just slowly um, increase the value of the business, increase the dividends that we share with those shareholders. And, 
if in 23, 24, I'm back here um, talking about $400 million and 8% of operating profit, I don't expect our market cap to be 38 million. So thank you, that is that's um, that is us. Um, thanks for the opportunity, Mark. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be very pleased to, to answer them. Hi, Gary, thanks uh, very much for that. Yeah, unfortunately, we're just up on time on your presentation, but um, I think you've answered a lot of them uh, as they came in anyway. Um, so I'm just going to quickly uh, hand over to our second presenter, which is uh, Rob Bristow. So Gary, if you can stop sharing your screen and then we'll uh, get Rob to share his. Thanks, Mark. Can you see that now? Uh, I can see your cover slide now. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you very much, much appreciated and uh, good to have the opportunity to have a chat with everyone this morning about CLIMB investment management. Uh, always a hard act to follow, Gary, so uh, hopefully I will uh, be able to give you some insight into CLIMB, uh, where we are today and more importantly where we're going. So by the end of today you'll have a bit of an understanding of the business and the journey that we've been on and uh, just as importantly the strategy that we're pursuing. Uh, you'll get a good sense of the challenges that we see in the marketplace, but importantly, you'll also get a good sense of the opportunities that we see in front of us and, and how we'll access them. Standard disclaimer, of course. So what I'll run through today is a little bit of an overview of the business. Uh, given that we've just uh, not long uh, published our results, I'll run through the FY20 highlights and financials, but then spend a little bit of time talking about the outlook. I think. Uh, you know, what we've seen in the last three months in wealth management is, uh, you know, the level of dislocation in the marketplace that, um, you know, is sort of once in a 10 year style event. And so we've been spending quite a bit of time looking at that and making sure that we're well positioned to take advantage of the opportunities that are coming up. So let me kick off with a bit of an overview. Now we, uh, I joined the business a couple of years ago now, and uh, part of that was about moving our strategy from climb being traditionally an Aussie equities asset management business to having a diversified financial services approach. And that's really about operating in three key divisions, investment management, where we focus on investing in quality companies with a strong valuation discipline. In wealth management, where our knowledge and insight and authentic approach empowers clients to take control of their finances and investor education, where we seek to inspire investors to take positive action to improve their wealth. So we've also, we've always had a very strong ethos about uh, cutting through the noise that's in financial services and being able to provide investors with actionable insights that will help them invest uh, with a bit more knowledge and a bit more insight into what's taking place in markets. From a group perspective, these are our values, integrity, transparency, and conviction. And I think you know anyone who's taken an interest in the wealth management space will understand that uh, you know what we saw through the Royal Commission is that those businesses that didn't have a focus on uh, both financial and non-financial metrics uh, were shown up to have some real challenges with their cultures. And one thing I'm really uh, proud to be involved with at Klein is that we've uh, we've got a culture that uh, weights financial and non-financial metrics very very fairly. So what we achieve is just as important as how we achieve, hence our values. This is what we look like from a group perspective. So we listed in 201, we established in 96. Um, there's more than 4.6 billion in group funds under management and advice. And I'll expand a little bit on that in the next little while. And we now have 42 staff across Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane with Sydney being our head office. So. We have been very fortunate with not uh, having to endure a long lockdown such as Melbourne has. Uh, and certainly the CBD here in Sydney in the last month or so is getting very busy again. So uh, almost back to normal, we would contend. Now I'm not going to run through those dot points there today, Mark, that uh, provides a little bit of background, but this presentation has been lodged with the ASX anyway. So anyone who wants to go through a bit of that detail can access that at any point. I think the main message to come out of that background slide is that, you know, our climb as an asset management business sort of uh, prior to my time had grown fairly slowly and steadily uh, to about 800 million under management. And uh, since I've joined and we've expanded the scope of the group and really focused on uh, growing that investment management footprint, but also introducing wealth management 
and scaling the investment, uh, the direct to investor solutions uh, has led to us undertaking a bit more uh, M&A activity, which I'll touch on shortly as well. So let me turn now to some of the FY20 highlights. And as I say, some of this was borrowed fairly heavily from the presentation that we just delivered as part of our, our update. But one of the first things that's worth calling out is that, you know, I think um, strategy in our sense is often defined as much as what you don't do is by as much as by what you do. And, you know, I think um, what's really important for us as a small business is to make sure that as we're growing to become a bigger business, we're really focused on how we allocate capital and the return on that capital that we generate. And so during the course of this year, uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work on making sure that each of the operating divisions uh, understands its competitive advantage, understands its competitive set, and also knows how we can compete. I think the other thing that's, uh, that's really uh, been a highlight of this last 12 months has been the way that we've been able to drive efficiencies in the business. So, um, and in fact, COVID was a, was a really good and timely um, reminder in a way that uh, we've got to take a look at every part of the business and make sure that we are operating efficiently, introducing efficiently, introducing technology wherever we possibly can. Now, I notice there's a few questions coming through, so I might just finish this slide and then I'll address those parts if that's okay. I think the other thing about FY20, and, and you know, we're obviously continuing to talk about this, is the impact of COVID-19. and. You know, we, we shouldn't underestimate this. I think, um, you know, in, in, the, in, our, in our sort of uh, business lives, things move so quickly that sometimes, you know, pausing and reflecting and looking back and understanding how we got here can be a really valuable, uh, valuable exercise. And I think for our business, you know, the big impact of COVID was that very sharp correction in equity markets in March. And in an extraordinary four-week period, the ASX all odds dropped over 37% between 21 Feb and 23 March, and the MSCI World Index dropped 34.2% during a similar period. So these, those drops were precipitous and had quite an impact on climate's business, which you'll see shortly. But having said that, we responded very quickly. So uh, in early April, we informed the market of the expense reductions that we put in place across the business. And um, you know, at the time, if you recall, there was quite a bit of uncertainty, and I think what we did is uh, we brought our team with us on those journey, on that journey, and I think it really taught us a lot about our culture, which was very positive. And uh, the level of engagement and support of the whole client team as we implemented those changes was uh, was very, very positive. But I think the important thing here is that it's not all doom and gloom. And I think uh, you know, in, in the face of the unwavering central bank support that we've seen around the world. Uh, you know, share markets have obviously rebounded strongly. August is, um, or September so far has come off a little bit, but compared to the March lows, markets have obviously rebounded strongly. And so that's had a very positive impact on clients' assets under management, which I'll touch on shortly. Now, this market correction also uh, presented quite a number of strategic opportunities for us. And uh, early on in the process of developing our current three-year strategy, we work across strategic planning cycles, but early three-year strategic planning cycles. And pretty early on, we identified the opportunity to grow our wealth management presence uh, through retail financial advice. And the main driver for that decision-making was that we have about 50,000 uh, self-directed investors in our, in our main database who receive our weekly newsletters uh, about investing and, and what they should be considering. And as we would go around the country and do our national seminars, which we've been delivering via Zoom since March, we would often be asked questions about, oh, you know, this is my situation. What should I do next? Uh, we realised that, A, we weren't licensed to provide any uh, sort of meaningful commentary in response, but B, there was also a significant commercial opportunity to, consistent with our ethos of helping clients improve their financial futures, uh, to offer a retail financial advice business. So Madison Financial uh, is a business that provides licensing services for about 100 financial advisors. And uh, just before June 30, we were successful in closing the acquisition of Madison Financial, which was a receiver sale from PwC, as Madison spun out of the, um, the uh, interesting activities that were associated with the Sargon Group, which went into receivership in early 2020. The price we paid for the asset was, was very attractive. We paid 4.4 million plus a small working capital adjustment. But importantly, two and a half million of that transaction price is actually held in escrow over a two year period. 
and we can draw that down in the event of certain activities relating to the performance of the Madison financial business that are well prescribed in the share sale agreement. So this transaction structure has significantly de-risked the acquisition for Quan shareholders and it's given us a, a springboard into some real uh, opportunities that I'll touch on shortly. We funded the acquisition via uh, an institutional placement of 4.4 million shares, which closed fully subscribed and uh, importantly, fully subscribed at an 8% premium to our current share price. We were one of only two companies who raised capital during that COVID period uh, to raise capital at a premium. So we were very happy with that result. I think, you know, the, the, the first question that I, that I get asked is that, you know, why did you do that? Why did you get into retail financial advice? And, you know, I think I articulated before the, the kind of strategic reason um, but also, you know, I climb as a business, and, and as you saw from one of the earlier slides, we've always taken a long-term view of opportunities in the market. And that view has often been contrarian, and we consider not just the current industry dynamics, but how that looks like over time. And financial advice for retail clients is a, is a precise example of that contrarian view, where we've gone against the grain of the industry, I kind of um, internally as a little bit of a tongue in cheek comment, but I describe financial advice in the context of the whole of the financial services market. I describe it as the worst house in the best street. And I do that very deliberately because I think the regulatory pendulum has swung a long way. Uh, I think what that's doing is it's professionalizing the industry. It's forcing participants to offer high quality services and put their client interests first. And I think that's a real positive in terms of the long-term future of retail financial advice as a service offering. And, and I know, you know Gary and I interestingly share quite similar views around that. And strategically, you know, Madison rounds out our wealth management capability. And so that's all about having retail financial advice, but also private wealth advice for wholesale, uh, wholesale clients as well. I think, the other thing that we've really seen is, uh, is the underlying business is performing very, very strongly. Uh, operating earnings, very robust growth, good performance to our non-financial metrics, and we've now got significant scale in the business. So I know that was a, a bit to work through on that slide, but I do appreciate you uh, hearing me out because I think that, that slide really kind of sets up our thought process around strategy for the next three to four years. Let me just quickly turn to the numbers. So this is what uh, I just very briefly mentioned before, but operating earnings, so this is the underlying business, EBITDA effectively up 86% on prior corresponding period. Now that 1.05 million number is obviously very small. Um, you'll see uh, where we think that uh, our opportunities are to expand that going forward. Net performance fee, so we really earn our revenue in three areas within Prime. We, we earn it from the operating business, from performance fees on the assets under management, uh, through the various investment solutions that we have. And we have uh, a large shareholding of our listed investment company that we are the uh, management manager for, which is called Quine Capital, um, that has a P&L impact based on its mark to market. Now, performance fees were down slightly on the prior corresponding period. So net performance fees uh, takes out any short-term incentives that apply to the team that generated those fees. And all of that was generated in the first half. So second half was very challenging. So if you think about the, uh, the operating leverage that we have in terms of driving increased revenue from performance fees, it's quite attractive. The, that really strong market correction in March had a, quite a significant negative impact on the mark-to-market assets that we hold on balance sheet, our, our shareholding in Climb Capital. So that was down 172% on prior corresponding period. So uh, that's the disappointing part of uh, this year's results. Uh, management team has spent quite a bit of time with the board around making sure that we sensibly deploy that capital over time into uh, activities that are going to be delivering not just a predictable, but a much higher return on equity. And that obviously flowed through to NPBT and NPAT, uh, which were down similar periods or similar amounts uh, on the prior corresponding period. So this slide just shows you that graphically, because I think that's uh, a good illustration. If you have a look at the trend in operating earnings, it's very positive. The trend in performance fees, given that uh, in FY20 that was only generated in the first half, is also very positive. Those assets held at fair value had a significant negative impact. I think the, uh, the 
the other thing that's important uh, when you're considering climb is that you know we we've probably traditionally been what we would call a, a value stock we are moving into uh, you know an environment where we are taking a much more assertive position around growth uh, but by the same token we're still paying uh, very very good yield so a total uh, two cents per share dividend during the course of the last financial year and over the course of the last 10 years we've returned about 26 million in capital to shareholders so uh, we believe that we're at a scale now where a lot of the growth that we can achieve is uh, can be largely sustainable. So let me now turn to the outlook and some of the things that we see around the future. And, and I'll, I'll deal with this in terms of our operating segment so you can get a sense of uh, what we think the, the sort of breakup is. First and foremost, investment solutions. Now, our investment management philosophy is about investing in quality companies with a strong valuation discipline. So these are the investment solutions that we offer across individually managed accounts for wholesale investors only, separately managed accounts for wholesale and retail, number of managed funds and our LIC. So you can see there's quite a uh, broad depth of capability across a range of different asset classes that Climb now offers uh, to the marketplace. A number of our managed funds have been rated by SQM and you can see all of those ratings are, are very, very high. So our smaller companies fund, which is a very, very strong performer, Australian Income Fund both rated four stars and our international fund rated four and a half stars. So uh, we're very proud of those achievements and smaller companies fund has just gone through its three year anniversary. Uh, the income fund has just gone through its five year anniversary and the international fund has been running for about six years as well. Now this chart shows you the uh, funds under management. So this is the funds that are directly managed by Climb's investment team. Going back to June 17, you can see it was uh, about 580 million. That jump there was when Climb acquired CBG Asset Management to get up over 750 million. Uh, I joined the business in about September 18 and the market promptly corrected. So uh, hopefully those two aren't correlated, but there you go. Uh, but then uh, we had good steady growth since that period. Um, and you'd really note the, the COVID correction in the March 20 quarter. Uh, but importantly, what you also note is, uh, is a very quick recovery and we're uh, back at those sort of highest ever fund levels from a group perspective as at the end of August. So let me turn now to wealth management, our second major operating division. And our services are, are available for both retail and wholesale investors. And, First and foremost, let's talk about retail. And this is the Madison Financial Group. So that was the acquisition that we completed in, in 2020. And, you know, the, I think everyone gets very excited about acquisitions, but at the end of the day, the value is released when it comes to the integration. And we have a really robust program of work. Uh, we're just about to come up to our first 100 days and we've announced a number of things internally and we'll shortly announce it to the market around some of the things that we've been working on that, uh, really demonstrate the successful integration of Madison into the business. And that includes supporting financial advisors with uh, systems and processes that enable efficient generation of financial advice. You know, I think if you looked across every uh, industry segment in the world, as regulation goes up, margin comes down. And so we see our key role there as making sure that we can help advisors work both sides of their balance sheet, increase revenues, but also uh, make sure that costs are coming down in their business and make sure they're compliant in the process. And then from a wholesale perspective, uh, our wholesale wealth management solution is Climb Private Wealth, which we launched last year. So this is a holistic advice and investment solution service for high net worth and sophisticated investors. And, uh, you know, clients come into our business from a range of different uh, segments and uh, those clients who are wholesale or high net worth uh, can engage with our private wealth team. And then this really shows you the assets under management just from a retail perspective. So this is what came into the business with Madison Financial. And I think, um, you know, the total sort of uh, assets under management or, or at, uh, funds under advice, if you like, about $3.6 billion. But importantly, uh, Wealth Portal, which is a white label of OneView's investment platform, uh, you know, that, um, that earns some margin for the group. Um, that will come out of the advice structure going forward and come over into the investment management structure. So those margins will be maintained. That has about 750 million in it. 
within those other investment platforms includes uh, an internal separately managed account business within Madison that manages around about 220 or 240 million. And that will also come over into the investment part of uh, what Climb does. And so that will give real scale to our SMA business. And uh, so we'll be managing around about uh, 300 million in SMAs from, from this point forward. So that gives us the ability to really springboard. And that's certainly the fastest growing sector of the market that we're seeing at the moment. And then about 74 million in insurance premiums under advice. So it's really uh, given Climb quite a lot of scale and quite a lot of opportunity to continue to grow. Now let me turn to our, our final division, Investor Education, which is all about inspiring uh, attendees to take positive action to improve their wealth. So our national program, uh, which we run every year, of course, uh, via Zoom from March, which uh, I think we've all become Zoom experts in the last few months, but certainly our, our first few presentations were a bit sketchy, but I think we've got there now, which is great. Uh, we've had 30 Investor Education events during the course of the year and 1,100 participants nationally. A lot more registrants than participants, but it's still been pleasing. Uh, quite a lot of people have embraced the digital delivery of these uh, investor education events. In terms of our, our footprint, uh, our active subscriptions to our weekly investment newsletter are about 5,000 across our total database of about 50,000. We've delivered more than 100 reports on, our, on market outlook and managed fund performance, more than 50 investor video updates and more than 100 print and 15 televised media appearances. So for a microcap business, we have a really strong footprint in the media and, and we're constantly sought out, whether it's myself, whether it's our founder, John Abernathy, whether it's Adrian Escaro, who leads our investment management team, or indeed our portfolio managers uh, across the board. We're often asked for commentary about what is taking place in markets and what we think, not just from an investment perspective, but trends in wealth management as well. Now, the other string to our bow in terms of uh, investor education is Climb Direct, and this is our DIY investor platform. And what Climb Direct does is it, uh, it allows subscribers to be able to use the same quantitative filters. So we, we obviously, with our investment team, have a focus on quality companies. We run a quant filter across the ASX, and uh, that gives us a short list of companies that we then want to undertake our bottom-up qualitative research on to determine whether or not those stocks end up in one of our portfolios. So subscribers to Climb Direct can actually anal uh, use, that same, uh, use that same research, use that same quant filter to do their own searches. And uh, now they can also invest in, uh, in their own separately managed account portfolio. So as they're doing those searches, they can uh, construct their own portfolios or if they're too concerned about uh, you know, building their own portfolio, they can actually use one of the Climb pre-built portfolios. And uh, we're seeing some really good flows into those portfolios already in this financial year which we only launched in March. And this year we've undertaken 1,500 demos and there's about 900 active subscriptions to Climb Direct. So this is a part of our, our business that um, we're looking forward to making some further investments in over the course of the next 12 months. So I'll just very quickly now turn to Outlook in the last few minutes and, and then uh, come back to any questions that might have come through. But uh, I think the first thing is that, you know, from an investment perspective, uh, you know, and, and I don't want to use today as the example, but you know, clearly markets were spooked overnight in the US. And I think uh, there's some real concerns. We've obviously got a lot of uncertainty around the US election. And, you know, in the absence of central bank support all over the world, there are, there are some residual concerns that we have about market stability. So, you know, one of our key triggers that we're uh, monitoring is making sure that uh, that stability and that support still exists. You know, I think um, some of the things, and we, we put out a media release around this not long ago, but um, from an Australian perspective, I, we think that the National Cabinet and the, uh, the federal government have done a great job in terms of uh, initiatives around, uh, around supporting the Australian economy. I think that's been very positive. I think what we're fearful of, though, is we want to see now a more coordinated and more integrated policy response where there's very clear investment. The cost of debt is so low that we want to see very clear investment into the areas that are going to lead to the future productive capacity of the economy. And you know, that would give us a lot of com comfort that uh, not only is there political stability for a long period of time, but there's economic stability that will see us springboard out of uh, you know, what could run the risk of being quite a, a long and severe downturn. 
from a headwinds perspective, I think, you know, we are, uh, one of the things that constantly exercises our mind as we grow from small to large is how do we make sure we get the right people into our business to successfully scale? How do we make sure we uh, either build or, or acquire the right technology? And how do we make sure that our processes keep our organisation compliant, keep our organisation uh, operationally robust, but also very efficient? And these all require capital. So we, uh, we think about these things very carefully and make sure that we understand the landscape quickly before we uh, make those investments. I think the other thing, and I'll, I'll put this in as a headwind, but you know, you could read it either way, but um, the market's moving very quickly and it's not, we, we often talk about what our competitors are up to, but it's not just uh, what competitors are doing. There's a, there's a lot of movement around changing consumer trends. There's a lot of movement around technology. There's a lot of movement around, you know, uh, distrust in institutions that for those of us who are, are my age, we've grown with these institutions being the foundation of trust for many of us. And what we're seeing now is, is new generations coming through don't have that same level of trust. They, in fact, have an active level of distrust. And so these things are changing the nature of what will define competitive advantage in the future. And so we think that that's something that requires constant attention. From a tailwinds perspective, and I, I touched on this before, but um, it's tough at the moment out there in the wealth management market, and I think it's really, really tough. The, the group that doesn't get a lot of uh, airtime in this is financial advisors. They're the ones who are helping clients through this really difficult period with COVID-19. They're the ones who are facing into all of this change. And I think um, in, the, in that context, as regulatory certainty uh, is provided, I think it can only help the whole industry. And I think that's a real tailwind for wealth management. You know, I talked before about the current market dislocation that's taking place. There, uh, this is a once in a ten year event. Um, you know, we've been inundated with with queries about how we can support financial advisors, and in fact, even how we can support different asset management businesses with some of the solutions that we offer. So, um, that's a strong tailwind for us around growth. And I think the other thing, and this touches on some of those consum consumer trends that I very briefly talked about before. Uh, you know, really, uh, the way that consumers are uh, engaging is changing and uh, we think that the opportunity to further empower consumers is, uh, is a real upside for us in our strong history, a long history, nearly 25 years of, uh, of empowering consumers through um, breaking down that information arbitrage and investing. So that, that's it for me. Thanks, Mark, for the opportunity. I think, um, you know, this last 12 months has been transformational in many ways for Climb. I think we've you know, we've built out our retail wealth management capability and now we've got a very integrated approach to wealth. We're continuing to grow our assets under management through our investment team and our direct-to-consumer business is growing as well. So we're in a good space and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to what the next few years is going to bring. Okay, thanks, uh, Rod. Uh, I have a couple of questions actually came in via email. If you can hang on for a minute or two and we maybe might just run through them. In terms of future acquisitions, um, somebody wants to know, should we think about that being in the investment management side to bring in more from like uh, CBG or on the wealth side to kind of bolster, I guess, the, the beachhead you've created by bringing Madison under the climb umbrella? I don't think it's either or. You know, the way, the way that we look at uh, merger and acquisition opportunities is there are three elements to it. There's a strategic fit, a cultural fit, and the numbers have to work. And if all of those boxes are ticked, we're happy to, to have a, a detailed look at M&A. Um, but I think what we have done is we've given ourselves the ability now to expand our, our capability to look at whether it's investment management or wealth management, or in fact, even in the direct space. So, um, I wouldn't rule anything in or out at this stage. I think if the numbers work, if we've got a team of people who um, is committed to sort of becoming part of what we're doing and, and you know, helping clients along the way, then, uh, you know, those opportunities will pursue. I, I wouldn't categorise it according to whether it's one or the other. It could be, could be wealth, it could be investment, it could be both. Okay, and then another question then on the investment management side. Is there a plan to, to further build out the, the products in that division, um, you know, a la private equity or, you know, we're seeing a lot of public to private products um, hitting the market, uh, I guess, yeah, expanding the, the product offering within investment management? Yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, 
you know, at the moment, the assets that are managed by our team uh, internally or on balance sheet are Aussie equities, and that's all cap and small cap uh, and fixed income. So, you know, they're our core teams. Um, we do property via a range of different, whether it's syndicates or direct, and and we um, we currently subcontract our international management through a third party manager. So, you know, when I when I think about what climb should look like in three to five years and, and what is going to maximise enterprise value for shareholders. I think the asset, our core asset classes where we have demonstrated capability, where we feel like we've got a competitive advantage, they should absolutely be on balance sheet. They should be managed by internal climb teams. So that's something we're in fact actively looking at right now. Yeah, and then uh, maybe uh, a more kind of structural question, but um, is there any plans for uh, climb the, the LIC to follow the Magellan structure where you know you've got the 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 ability to swap between the unlisted vehicle and and the listed vehicle uh, seamlessly. Yeah, it was a really clever structure that, that Magellan put in place, and uh, I think what that's done is it's forced a lot of a lot of investment managers to be thinking about their own product solutions and. You know, when you think about trends, about how consumers will uh, acquire financial services and embrace financial services in future, I think the reality is that, you know, the, the old traditional model of, of uh, you know, essentially having your LIC distributed by an advisor with managed funds or, or with a typical managed fund style model, I, I don't think that model's got a long-term future. And so we're certainly looking at what do we think the right model is going forward? Um, and that's one of the factors that we're, we're considering is what does that look like from a, um, you know, what Magellan have done? Is that the sort of thing that we would want to embrace? And recognising we share the same back office service provider. Yeah, I think that's kind of where the question is coming from. Okay, we're going to leave it there because we're gone slightly over time and I'm conscious that the, the opening match has started. Um, I'd like to thank both our presenters today and everyone for dialing in. And as I said, recording will be up probably on Saturday on the YouTube channel. And we I'll be in touch uh, about the next two companies that will be coming up in... Uh, number 12 in the series of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a good day.